And, you, you know, it's very interesting to me as well that on any of this, the two entities that people in this country trust the least, the media and the politicians, and yet when it comes down to them, they'll trust them on, on certain things and say, well, well, they wouldn't lie to us over coronavirus. Trump wouldn't lie to us when he said this, or, or even, you know, Biden. Biden wouldn't lie to us. You know me, you know, I've tried to warn people about Trump for a long time. But it doesn't matter. Um, uh, people forget their own principles, and for people f- neglect their own common sense, and they neglect their own spiritual discernment even. But let's turn to the Word of God. Let's turn to Deuteronomy, if we will. And let's talk about what God himself said. You know, before man ever knew, God, if nothing else, our Father, if nothing else, knows his children. And he knew that there would come a time, even before they did, and even before that time came, he knew that there would come a time, and if you want documentation, this is the documentation. This is before they ever came to Samuel and said, Give us a king. Find us a king. Uh, this is when they were, they had not even entered the promised land. This is when they were still wandering in the wilderness. And yet God knew there's going to come a time in which his people would ask for a king. Why? He knows his children. He knows their tendencies, especially in the flesh. That's why even, it, it did, he did regret to a, a very a certain extent, as written in in Genesis 6, that it it did grieve him that he put us here in the flesh. But at the same time, it was his plan and and necessary for him to do so. But let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14. God's word, God's instruction, God's advice. You can either pay attention to it, or you can ignore it. That, that is always your choice, friend. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, When thou art come into the, unto the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, in other words, of course, it hadn't even happened yet, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, What? I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. In other words, we, we don't necessarily need to follow God or we don't need God as our king. No, we need to be like everybody else. We don't need to be set aside. We don't need to be chosen people, peculiar people, special people. Uh, we want to be like the rest of the world. We want to be like like the heathen nations. He knew that it would happen, and of course, naturally, it did happen. Man in the flesh. 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. In other words, it was to be of the tribes. And of course, back during this time, especially after we had the the influx and the, the fallen angels that mixed with the daughters of man, and the giants that, that resulted. You, you didn't want to go through that again. Even though we did have another influx, of course. But you, you, God did not want his people going down that road. Uh, you did not want race mixing, religion mixing. Now, if you had one that, that uh, was of a different people, that believed or that followed... Uh, then that was fine, and and that was welcome. But they were to follow the law, like and God's instruction and law, as all of the people of the Hebrew children were. And uh, they certainly would not be made king. Verse uh, sixteen: But he shall not multiply horses or possessions, if he will, to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. To the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall know, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Now, going back to Egypt was going back to Egypt, but at the same time today, it's going into bondage, it's going into slavery, 
spiritual slavery, uh, being a, a, a slave, if you will, of the government, being a slave, if you will, to those who are the money changers, to those who tie this country and all of our people up into usury. And, you know, I, I lost a Facebook friend, which it was what it was. I unfriended her because of her attitude. But I lost a Facebook friend that I'd known online, not personally, as far as having met her in real life, but I'd, I've known online for 20 years. Because all of a sudden, she decided she was going to start following a particular politician, who happened to be Trump, and that news that the deficit, or the debt, excuse me, had gone up $6.6 .6 trillion with him in office, well, that's not his fault. That's sandbagging his presidency. Well, it comes along with the job. And it is something that he, along with everybody else in Congress, is supposed to be more responsible about. And, of course, none of them are, essentially, when it comes down to it, or very few. But uh, that is one of the chief ways, if not the, the chief way, to put people in bondage in this country is to tie them up in debt that they could never pay back. That this generation and the next generation and probably the generation after that, if they would come, could never pay back. And it, it certainly didn't start with, with this president, but it obviously isn't ending with him or getting any better now either, is it? Um, verse 17, Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Again, being, being obsessed, being overly concerned with wealth, with trying to find ways to enrich himself. Again, uh, I mean, could we say that about this president, for one? Yeah, and you could say that about a lot of the politicians as well, who take bribes. You know, take, take a little bit of this money from this lobbyist and, and pass this law or write this law and, and, and let it be. And that's your government, and, and it has been your government for some time. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law, what law, this law, this word of God, in a book out of that which is before the priests, the, Le the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them. Not just to know them, not just to have an awareness of them, but to do them. And to keep them in his heart. To have it be front and center in the way that he leads his life and that he governs his nation. Well, you don't understand their separation of church and state. No, the, the, the church, the true church, is always supposed to be the conscience of the state. And you don't have to ask or you don't have to dictate or demand that everybody be a Christian. But there is absolutely nothing wrong whatsoever with a... In fact, that's ideally what most of us, actually all of us who would uh, speak this or listen to this probably would want. was a would be a true Christian who lets that guide them in their decision-making process when it comes to governing the affairs of this nation or any nation that would be majority Christian, if you will. Verse 20, that his heart, what? That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. Well, well fish out of the right side of the boat. No, stay don't be wishy-washy. And yes, most of us still, no doubt, would lean more, if you want to say, politically right. But stay on a straight path with God's Word. Don't get off into things that take you this way or that way and take your eyes off of Him. Right or left, there's extremes on both sides. 
to the end that he may prolong his days and his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now, you know, let's go back to Egypt, if we may. I know that's not a... And let's not literally go back to Egypt, but let's go back to that time. And let's just... I know this isn't a believer or, or of our people or a Christian or Israeli or whatever you want to call him, Hebrew. But it's a king. It's a politician. It's somebody in power. Let's see what their word means. Let's go to Exodus chapter 7. And God had told Moses that, that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. And we're going to see seven times. It took seven times, an interesting number, without a doubt. But seven times before he would actually let the people go, that he would stop going back on his word. And even on the seventh time, he ultimately went back on his word then. But Exodus chapter 7 um. God saying, uh, verse, we'll stay with, or we'll start with verse 2. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. Three, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And five, the Egyptians, this being the point, shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So he knew that Moses and Aaron knew that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. Now let's look at it being hardened. Exodus 8, verse 8, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let thy people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? 10, and he said, Tomorrow, and he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And uh, that plague of frogs just disappeared, but what happened? 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, oh, oh I, I asked that, that he do this for me, and he did it. Did Pharaoh keep his word? No. He hardened his heart and hearkened not unto him as the Lord had said. Now again, God said it, but here you have a king, here you have a ruler, here you have a politician, and it's no different today. You say, well, we're going to hold you accountable, and you better do it this time. Oh, oh okay, I'll do it. And then as soon as you believe that person, and you let them off the hook, and you stop holding them accountable, they go back to their old ways. They go back to doing what they want to do. And I think for time's sake, because I've only got about 16 minutes here, uh, you, you can read it, 16 and a half minutes, and I want to cover some other ground, but you can read it over and over again. Like I said, I counted them up seven times. You can read, uh, I have written down here, Exodus 9.27, you'll see the third time. Exodus 10.8, you'll see the fourth time. 10.16, you'll see the fifth time. 10.24, you'll see the sixth time. And then finally, after you have the firstborn of all man and cattle, animals in Egypt that are of the Egyptians, with those who put that blood over their doorpost of the children of Israel being passed over, and that beginning, documenting, uh, starting the Passover promise, the Passover feast, but that after you had that death of the firstborn, that Pharaoh, on in that seventh, seventh time of saying, okay, take your people, Moses, and leave, and he did allow him to leave. But again, as we know, even after that, he decided, wait a minute, I'd better get him back, and he sends his army after him, where you have the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, or Sea of Reeds, where the children of Israel walk across on dry land, the armies of Pharaoh, the armies of Egypt, get swallowed up and get drowned within that same sea. But again, here you had a pop.